Hey, what's going on guys? It's Coach Bronson here and I want to introduce Dr. Bill Schindler in this video. Dr. Bill Schindler is a really cool guy. I met him at KetoCon earlier in 2022 and uh, just we kind of hit it off. We got a lot of things in common. We're both active. Um, we both have a passion for what we do. What he does is really cool. He's into ancestral living and breaking down how we evolved and developed as a human race and trying to bring those techniques and ideas and concepts into our modern lifestyle so that we can kind of get back to our roots and living as healthy as possible in spite of our technology. Really interesting conversation. We talk about all sorts of things, history, archaeology, nutrition, electrolytes, uh, just all sorts of stuff, kind of comparing where we are today versus where we started. So take a look. We'll see you inside. Basically, we can just start with saying, hey, Dr. Schindler, how are you today? <laughs> oh, fantastic. It is so good to see you. Absolutely, man. Uh, we met at KetoCon this year. I've been following you for a while. Um, and uh, you have, so you're kind of in the health and nutrition space, the wellness space, not really keto, but very animal, animal based, meat based. You kind of are just doing more stuff, um, more paleo primal getting mm -hmm. back to our roots i don't know what the right word is what's the right word for where you kind of fit into this whole thing i still got to work on that elevator speech too i, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I have no idea i i'm coming at certainly from the ancestral food space ancestral, for sure go. yeah yeah um so it's a combination of all, all those different aspects paleo being a large part of it yeah but a couple things that are different about my approach number one is um you know, most people that are in the ancestral space, not all, but most, many of them, especially in the paleo space, sort of had this artificial line that they draw on the sand at about 12, 10 to 12,000 years with the agricultural revolution and say everything before it is good. Everything since then is, is bad. And not only wrong, a ton of horrible things that happened to our food system in the past 12,000 years. But yeah. um, there are some things I think we can, you know, good progress is, I don't know if that's the right word, but developments in our food system have been made in the past 12,000 years that I think we should be paying attention to. Um, I am in the low carb space. Some, I follow a low carb diet. My wife follows a low carb diet. Um, but at the same time, what's, uh, what we're trying to do is also, we, we have a ton of, and we'll talk about it. We have a lot of customers and a lot of our audience are not just eating low carb or have people in their families that aren't. And we're trying to provide them with the information and also the food that they can use to, to nourish themselves, whether they're low carb or not. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. So just how did you get started in all this? Let's just go back to the beginning. Um, ancestral eating, ancestral nutrition, learning how to make arrowheads out of stones, like all the things that I've seen you doing. I remember at KetoCon, I was walking by and you had Danny Vega over there in the corner. You're chipping away at some rocks and stuff. Like, how does one get even get into that kind of stuff? I got into it not because of food. You know, food was something that I always wanted to know more about. Food, I, I always loved being in the kitchen. I grew up watching Julie Child on our little black and white TV when I was a kid. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> it was in the kitchen all the time with my mother and my grandmothers. Um, but it was so weird because there was there were sort of these two tracks in my life that kind of came together about 20 years ago. One was food, food, diet, health, all of it. Um, and I, I thought... Because, you know, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s where we were told by the FDA and doctors and nutritionists and everybody how we should be eating. All As we know now, most of that information was very, very poor. Yeah. I remember going to the health food store with my mother. My mother was very interested in making sure her family was as nourished as, as we could be. But at the same time, getting this horrible advice from, from everyone. And we go to the health food store. And I remember going to the health food store in, in Little Silver, New Jersey. And, and every time I went there, I was just struck by how sickly everybody looked that was that was there. I mean, everybody just looked too thin. Their skin was pale. Their eyes were drawn. And I'm like, this doesn't look like health, but everybody's still going and spending all yeah. this money. Um, and so I was trying to solve my own health issues. I, I have had an incredibly unhealthy relationship with food, was overweight for most of my life, with all sorts of metabolic disease, and um, through all sorts of fad diets like everybody else was. But at the same time, and this is the part that sounds so strange now because it's they're so interconnected that at the same time, my father had me hunting, fishing, trapping outside all the time. We were we were butchering animals. We we're doing all these things now that is the basis 
for how I look at the world and how I look at food and diet and health, mm -hmm. but they were running parallel, but never connected. Um, Interesting. And I didn't, it, it was strange, but the reason I started getting into archeology span and stone tools and all that was through that hunting lens. You know, I loved being in the woods with my father. I loved hunting. I loved everything that it brought to us and how it connected us. And, but I, I, I really just wanted that connection to the past connection, to the environment connection, to the animals to be a little bit deeper, loved yeah. hunting love gun hunting. But I said, I, if I'm going to do this, I need to be a little bit closer. Like I, I want to bow hunt. I want to be a real part of this. So I started bow hunting, okay. but you know, I had this like $700 compound bow and could still shoot, for, you know, nail something at 40 yards with a, with an arrow and a bow and a tip, all this that I had nothing to do with other than, other than buying it and sighting it in. So uh, I learned how to make bows. I learned how to make strings. I learned how to make arrows. That information wow. was there, but I couldn't find information at the time it's it's fairly readily available now but at the time before the internet before all the social media mm -hmm. i couldn't find how to make an arrowhead like i did a stone point Interesting. and there was some information not great but so i started to play around and now i know now there's a huge amount believe more than you can imagine amount of people around the world that are experts at replicating stone tool technology but at the time again it was hard to connect with people and i didn't understand it and i started to slowly realize that a there were some people out there i could learn from and i started to and b that the answers i was really looking for about how people in the past got their food you know how it impacted their diets all of that the connection i was looking for i could find through archaeology so head first into a rabbit hole into archaeology primitive technologies awesome. i work with great people all over the world to learn how to replicate these technologies and but again all these things are happening i'm hunting with stone points i'm hunting with homemade bows and i'm still heavy i'm overweight i'm you know yeah. I, I, I feel terrible and then finally i realized that the answers to the questions i was asking where it could be found by really diving deep into the ancestral dietary base. yeah let's talk about that because that's a really interesting that uh, you kind of lead right into my next question is wh how did those two worlds come together and you start realizing that these things i'm doing here for my interest and fun and hobby and passion actually can affect my health and my quality of life like where yeah, did still. that how does that how does that happen so this is there's a story we always tell christine and i both do it is um uh it's, it's a simplified version of something that took longer than this one conversation. But yeah. it, it, I think, I think it, <laughs> it always takes way longer than, yeah. But I, I, you know, I think you and I are the same in many ways where, you know, we, we get so passionate about something. We dive deep. You and I were talking earlier about how we, you know, we don't do downtime very well. So when I dove down this rabbit hole in archeology span and ancestral technologies, primitive technologies, I dove deep. Like I just learning how to do something is not where I like to stop. I, I, I want to, you know, do my best to become an expert in whatever I'm, I'm trying to do. And even though I, you know, would rarely reach that point, that journey is, is worth it. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing about stone tool technology is it's, it's incredibly difficult to master and it takes truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of rock and, you know, years of practice. So I had some incredible mentors, Dr. Eric Callahan Dr. Jack, or, and Jack Cresson and, and, and a few other people around the world that I learned from, but it was that daily practice that was incredibly important. And the questions, the, the intricate questions in the archaeological record that I was trying to answer through this, um, through this work required me to reach a skill level that took years of practice. So I, I committed myself to every day I'd spend minimum one hour a day banging on rocks. And I know that sounds silly, but at least no, one yeah. a day. this was going on for years. And the, you know, we, we just started to have a family and I was a professor at Washington college and I, you know, I'm there doing my job there. I'd come home and do the family. And then every night I'd go out into the garage and I'd sit there and bang on rocks for a couple hours. And one night my wife comes outside and I think she was getting the kids in a bath or something. She goes, listen, I need you to come inside. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be there. I'll be right there. I'll come and help. She's like, no, no, that's not what I mean. I said, yeah, come in now. I need you now. The kids are screaming, but I need you to bring all of this, like this, this passion, this drive, this, you've gone down this rabbit hole, bring it into the house. I need you physically in the house. And if you're going to do something this, you know, all in, it, it, it should help the family. Right. I mean, and, okay. and she was right. hundred percent. Like, yeah, you're right. Not, not that I was being selfish, but if, if I'm doing it, you know, the people I care about the most were like a wall away from me. What, and me banging on rocks other than helping get a paycheck teaching is not helping the family at all. How can I bring it all together? So I took it to heart. I thought about it really, really hard for a couple of weeks. And one, one day in the shower, 
it literally hit me like a ton of bricks. Like I get it. And, and this is, uh, this is, I think the I'm confident is the basis for all the research I've done over the past 20 years yeah. and is the basis for how I look at human diet and health. I realized that almost every single prehistoric technology, and, and I mean the first tech stone tool technology uh, that we've identified started at 3.3 million years ago. So for almost three and a half million years, almost all of the prehistoric technologies have something to do with food, like getting food, processing food, storing food, redistributing food, serving food, whatever, something to do with food, Tra- taking, helping you get, helping our ancestors and us get raw materials from our environment and then most importantly doing something to those and it turns out to make them as safe and nourishing as possible almost every single albert einstein inventor we've ever had of all of our ancestors for millions of years what they invented somehow did something to food and so hold on to that for a second that's kind of powerful in itself but at the same time if you realize and it's true that our our diet the changes in our dietary past over these millions of years help support massive body and brain growth, help support the creation of new species over years and over millennia, and eventually help create the first homo sapiens, us, Mm -hmm. 300,000 years ago. So if the diets help support these massive changes that help create us as a species and nourish, increasingly nourish, and the technologies played a major role in the development of or the changing of those diets, then we can't separate those two. Like us as a species here with the ability to create the technologies that allowing you to meet, communicate, allowing us to do all the things that we do in these massively huge brains and bodies has some of those technologies were that important to it, then we can't escape the role of those technologies in our food system even today because we're still stuck in these 300,000 year old bodies mm. with massive nutritional requirements. So that's, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, stone tools do make sense. Like here I am trying to not only you know, get, live my best life and, 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 and get it healthier than I've ever been. But I now have other people that are, you know, my kids and my wife that are, you know, trying to, to nourish as well. Those technologies play a major role. So I dove deep into doing everything I could to understand the technological role of our dietary past, which is exactly what archaeology is. Archaeology yeah. is looking at the residues of activities and these technologies. So that makes sense. And then more recently over the past seven or eight years, um, we've also, my wife and I, the whole family really have, have started to realize that we can plug gaps in our knowledge of our dietary past by looking at traditional and indigenous groups that are still living today, adhering to certain ways that they're approaching food. Okay. And it's been a game changer, huge yeah, game changer. Yeah. So then you took some of that stuff and applied that to your own lifestyle. This is how we used to eat. This is how, like, this is what our, we've been doing for years and years and years and years, maybe we should start doing that too. Absolutely. And, and so here's, here's the thing. I, I certainly don't have any answers. I have some answers, I think, but I don't have yeah. all the answers for sure. <laughs> and none of us do. But, but what, I, what, what this has allowed me to do, this new perspective has allowed me to at least ask, I think for the first time in my life, the right questions. And I know that sounds strange, but I remember, and I, I said this the other day, actually, it's kind of embarrassing, but this is, this is how we make change in the world by telling embarrassing stories. But I was, you know, the incredibly overweight kid that, uh, yeah, anyhow, had incredibly poor self body image, getting, you know, getting made fun of and beat up all the time at school playground and the like. And I remember getting out of the shower one day. So I was naked and I had to go to the bathroom. So I'm sitting on the toilet and I looked down and I looked down on myself sitting down on the toilet. And you know, no matter what, when you look down, you always see, the worst, you know, yeah, you know, the worst more, view. Yeah, so I, the worst view. So I look down and I see these rolls in my belly. And I remember, I was young. I don't know. I was, I was probably 10 years old, 12 years old. And I remember grabbing all the fat with my, with my hands and just holding it and just feeling disgusting about myself. And I even said out loud, I said, if somebody could just tell me what I should eat, then all my problems will be changed. All, yeah. all my problems will be solved. Yeah. And, for, and that was ignorant for a couple of reasons, but... Um, I, I am for one is I thought if I was skinny, then all my other, anything else going on in my life would get healed. But the other thing that was ignorant about it, which I think is, um, some really important for us to recognize as humans is that I ask what I should eat. If somebody tells me what I should eat, then all my problems will be solved. And that's, that's the, 
the question or the answer to that question is what's driving almost all nutritional research today, almost all nutritional advice today. And certainly it's important. But with humans, here's the difference. We were wild animals. Up until three and a half million years ago, we were our ancestors were wild animals running around eating diets that our bodies were designed to consume. Just like today, a cow is designed to eat grass, predivorous birds are designed to eat grains, you know, whatever is designed to eat whatever, that's what they eat. Because all they have to get their food is their bodies, and all they have to digest their food safely and efficiently is what's inside their bodies. Humans are different. We started to domesticate ourselves about three and a half million years ago when we created these technologies. And when we started creating these technologies, even simple but powerful technologies like stone tools or fire or fermentation, allow us digging sticks, knives, whatever, allow us to not only overcome our physical limitations and access increasingly diverse resources from our environment that we never had access to before just because we physically couldn't get them. But even more importantly for us, is we process, we as a species and our ancestors process food outside of our bodies. We do a lot of the work that other animals do inside of their bodies. We do it before we eat it to transform those nutrients in the safest and most nourishing forms possible for our bodies. And what's happened over millions of years is the better that we got at doing that, the more our bodies and our brains could grow. We have a huge influx of incredible nutrition, incredible bioavailable nutrition. Our bodies don't have to work too hard to get it. It's safe because we made it safe before we've eaten it, or it was just safe because it was, an, it was a resource that was safe. Our bodies and our brains are growing over millions of years, but our digestive tract is not because we don't need it to. Like we're doing all that work with fire and the stone tools and with fermentation or whatever we're doing. Hmm. So here we are now in these 100% fully domesticated bodies. We have literally farmed ourselves. We require all of that extra input on our, on our nutrients to make them as safe and nourishing as possible. Our digestive tract is 60% the size that it should be. It's almost half the size that it should be to support bodies of the size and brains with the nutritional requirements that we have. And here we are with a, with a modern food system that is processing food at the expense of nutrients, processing food it's a at whole the different, expense. Right. It's, it's kind a of thing. gone the whole different way, right? It's, we, we, we used to process the food so that we can get the most out of it. Now we're processing it so it tastes good. And it can ship far and it has yeah, a shelf and life. It can ship and it looks the same. Line. Yeah, right. The difference between I, something you said earlier, you know, your, your, your mother wanted to make sure you were nourished. And I think we've gotten away from nourishment and we're, we're focusing on getting fed. As long as we eat, mm -hmm. we're happy. Mm -hmm. yep. There's no, no, no concept of am I getting nutrients out of what I'm eating? It's just, I just need to eat. And I'll okay. just and eat anytime I feel like I need to eat, I'm going to eat. It's not about, it's not about nourishment. And we have such, we have so normalized, we've normalized so many things in our life that we, that, that are actually completely artificial and, and not real, but because we've normalized it, it sounds normal, right? So things like, <laughs> um, if we're, if we're going to get in shape, we should be suffering, right? If we're going to get in shape, oh. we should be eating foods that don't taste good. If we're going to get in shape, yep. we should feel hungry at every meal or else, you know, if we don't have this sort of self, like, you know, uh, torture, then we're not doing our job. Um, yeah. You know, those, those sorts of things, aches and pains, older and like all that. I remember we were filming the video for a uh, wired magazine, and the, the crew came down from New York a couple of years ago and we went out to lunch and I, I, we were talking about the Nordic food lab, which is a fantastic food lab out in Copenhagen. It's now affiliated with Copenhagen university, but it used to be the test kitchen for Noma, the best, used to be mm. the best, best restaurant in the world. And um, they would do these really powerful, but simple activities with the community. Like they would say, for example, um, you know, how do you know what apple you like? I know, I know we're a low carb, Community. Yeah, like, no, for fine. example, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, what kind of apple do you like? Like everybody, everybody who eats apples goes to the store and like, I want that apple. But how many people have gone to the grocery store and have literally tried every oh, apple in apple. the yeah. grocery store to know that that's the apple you want? No, that's the apple that you're used to having. It's the one on sale. It's when your mother bought whatever, but you haven't tried them all. So they would put out a thing and here's all the different apples that are available in, in Denmark. Have a taste. Like stand here and just have a little bite of each one. And you know what the texture and, and um, you know, I was using that as an example. Say that's powerful. Like you're, whether or not it's an apple or a piece of meat or whatever it is, we are making decisions about what we think we know, but we really don't know the entirety of, of, of what the different tastes or textures or value, whatever it is. I said, it's the oh same thing God. with diet. I said, yeah. how many people are making a decision about what to put in their mouths to nourish themselves, but have literally never in their life had a truly nourishing meal. Like they don't have that baseline to say, 
This is how I feel after being, you know, literally eating a fully nourished meal. So I'm having this conversation that the the head guy, the the, um, producer, he kind of drifted off for a minute. I thought I lost him. So we're talking and, and we start walking back up here to the food lab to to, the film. And, and he was still, I said, you okay? He's like, yeah. So what's wrong? He's like, and this guy was like 30, 32 years old. I just, I, I, I don't think I've ever had a truly nourishing meal in my life. <laughs> I, literally, I literally don't have anything to compare it to. Like, oh my God. Wow. And I, and I think that's huge. I mean, it's, and yeah. I'm like I say, we should, our goal should be every time we get up from a table, we should feel better than when we sat. Down. That's what nourishment is about. Like we yeah. feel better. We feel satiated. We feel full, but not too full. We don't feel hungry. We don't feel sick to our stomach. We don't, and, and part of this is biological. We make, make sure we nourish ourselves biological. Part of this is emotional and cultural. We get up and we're like, yeah, I know I feel good, but I shouldn't eat that because it goes against my ethical standards of whatever, or cultural or religious or political, right. or whatever it is. And that should be a goal. And even if we hit that goal every now and then, we're a heck of a lot better off than, than we are right now. Yeah, that's a, really, that's a really good, interesting point about feeling good after you get up. And outside of just the physical, like you said, the nutrition aspect of it, feeling full and everything else, but there's a mental aspect of if you're eating something that you feel bad about eating after you ate it, then that experience is a negative experience. And yeah. every time you sit down and do that, you're reinforcing negativity around food. Yeah, it's a absolutely. big, that's a big thing. And we that's not, I mean, food is supposed to be nourishing and helpful and healthy and supporting your ability to do things and growth mindset. And there's all these things about it that we want food to be. Um, and, and people don't have that. I liken it to the idea of uh, not to get too sociopolitical, but Americans, the United States citizens are very sheltered in our country. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend if anybody has never traveled outside of the U.S., to travel to other countries and find out how other people live because your mind is going to be blown. You're yeah. going to be exposed to a way of life, a mentality, the, the interaction, the community. There's so many other things that are different than what we're used to. And if you never get outside of what you're used to, you're never going to really know what's possible. And I, I, that's with food. It, it's the same way. I like that. And, and, you know, you make such an incredible point about traveling outside of this country. This is a little bit off topic and it'll only be 30 seconds, but barely yeah. one minute. I think this is this is we have been very fortunate because of my work and um, some of the opportunities we've had. We've been able to take the entire family all over the world, you know, a lot. But now we did it on a, a budget, mm-hmm. but, you know, a low budget. But we it was so important to us that we made the conscious decision to not only for me to go, but not only for me and my wife to go, but the entire family to go. It's been so, I, truly, I think it's probably one of the best gifts we've ever given our kids. But financially, so many people um, financially think that going somewhere else is beyond what they might, might be able to afford. Let me just give a very quick example. There was one year, uh, this was about eight, seven or eight years ago, that um, we were going to go do some research in Spain and France. We were going to mm-hmm. fly into Madrid. Um, do some work there. There were some caves we wanted to visit there. They were going to drive north to Spain to see about the cave paintings there, and then into southern France to see major some major cave art uh, down there. And anyhow, we were gone for five weeks. We we rented a car in Madrid. We drove up through Spain into Paris. Spent a couple nights in Paris. Took a train over to Belgium. Then went and visited friends in, in the Netherlands. I mean, it, it was a magnificent trip. The same year, um, with the grandparents' help. We took the kids, they, they they wanted to go to Disney. We went to Epcot. I just remember us going to Epcot. It was cheaper to bring five kids. If I, I'm sorry, five people, my entire family of five, and to Europe, spend five weeks in Europe, wow. see these places for real than it was to spend one week at Disney. Wow. Wow. So it's there. It's That's just, crazy. I mean, it's what there. we prioritize and, and all that makes a big difference. But And it's probably, and that was how long ago? That was about seven or eight years ago. And here, yeah. here's another great. We're, we're I'm speaking in Norway in um in Oslo in October, and my wife and I were looking at tickets yesterday. And we also saw friends of ours. Uh, they visited, and they're from they flew in from Denver. We're talking about prices uh, two days ago. We're talking about airline tickets and prices. We can get to Oslo round trip direct for five hundred dollars, and the cheapest thing that they could find from Denver right now was about seven. I mean, it is it, it wow. is insane. That's it's crazy. insane. Yeah, and right I just now I know. 
Yeah, but then you've also got now Airbnb is way bigger. There's, I mean, there's so many options for things nowadays that we didn't have seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Yeah, for stuff. That's awesome. All right. So you said something interesting. You said cave paintings. Um, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've seen the whole. Um, I've never seen a cave painting of salad. Right? Is that is that a thing? Is that is that true? <laughs> never saw a cave painting of salad in my life. And we've seen. <laughs> You see, you see two things. Yeah. You see um, people leaving their mark, some kind of a, so, some, us leaving our mark in places is something that seems to be important all over the world through time. So handprints are usually mm -hmm. what it is, mm -hmm. um, which I love. And it's very interesting to see that it, this handprints are literally the same all over the world. They're doing the same exact thing. And it seems for the, for, for the same exact reason. Kind of, I was here, you know, it's kind of right. like, you know, yeah, yeah, putting yeah. your initials in a tree. Well, we do it. We do it in, Cement now, right? Yeah, we're it, doing it in cement. In, in cement, the kindergartners, yeah. we do it, yeah. yeah. Um, what's fascinating, too, is that um, there's a couple ways to do it, and it's mostly a negative impression of the hand. So you get – there's sometimes they're sticking their hand in paint like you do in kindergarten and putting it right. on the wall. But for the most part, they're putting their hand on the wall and spraying uh, a mineral pigment around it, usually okay. red ochre or charcoal or something. Um, sometimes blowing it through their mouths, we think, and sometimes there's other ways to do it. But it's, it's really interesting that – it's almost always a left hand and because they're uh -huh. doing something with their right to make okay. it happen. And the percentage is almost exactly of, of left-handed to right-handed through time as it is right now, which is, which is kind of, that's fascinating. Okay. Yeah. And then the second thing is, and more which you often, it's animals and it's animals usually depicting a hunting scene, but yeah. something important about the animals, which I, I know I'm, there's such a dichotomy now in, in the plant-based animal-based community and and it, but it is true i mean it i've never i've never seen a plant unless it was a tree made it into a spear on you know, <laughs> right on a, on a wall somewhere it's always animals. yeah and some of them are super cool there's some i mean and we're talking about cave systems where the the depiction is miles underground and people wow. you know having to get through and and you know, it's not like they have helmets on and you know right. to, to get to those places you're and it's super dark you're carrying fire you're carrying this all the way in you know a real long journey to just do this it must have been very important but sometimes there's there's a famous one uh where the animal's head is you know you have a depiction of it and then there's like partial heads like leading up to it there's a there's a few of them and it's hard to describe they have a replication of a replica of it in the smithsonian but nobody could figure out what is this? Like, yeah. I don't understand what's happening here. Were they high when they were doing it? And, they, but, and it turns out that um, when somebody brought fire, you know, everybody's looking at this cave art with, you know, a flashlight and they're looking right. at it and they're staring at it with this constant light. But when somebody's like, no, let's replicate what was happening when they were there. When you brought a flame in and it was flickering, it actually made it look like it was moving in three dimensions. It was what? awesome. Super cool. What? That's super crazy. Super cool. Yeah. Wow. Okay. But the animals, yes, animals. It, I mean, we can get on the whole topic of just the technology and the awareness of stuff that was going on that we have no concept of back in there. But that's maybe a video where you can just educate us all on where or do aliens exist and all that other kind of stuff. But <laughs> um, where did the pyramids really come from and everything else? Um, what? So I, I love your shirt, Eat Like a Human. That's the name of your book, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what is that book about a little bit? And then I want to ask you, how does eat like a human match up to Dr. Barry's proper human diet? So the, yeah, the title, the title of the book is eat like a human. And the, the way the book is set up is the first change. I, I really believe that understanding the foundation of our, of our dietary past is incredibly important. Without that, we're just sort of, you know, grasping at straws and yeah. trying to figure this out and without, so the first chapter is all about just sort of a, a comprehensive but quick view of what our dietary past has been like for several million years to sort mm -hmm. of set the context. And what, what was the diet, you know, how did the diet change? What was important? What technological innovations were important to it? And then what was that diet like when, when Homo sapiens first appeared? Because I think that mark is, or that moment in, in prehistory is incredibly important. The, the rest of the book is divided into different food types. So animals, okay. dairy, grains, whatever. And the rest of the book, and, and along with uh, Eat Like a Human, our entire message, our mission, all of our work is is mostly aimed at asking or answering the question, what, I'm sorry, how I should be eating, not what. And that was sort of what I was referencing earlier. What is important, but what isn't the entire story for humans? Mm -hmm. 
how is the important part. What what do should we be doing to these different um, foods, food groups, types of food to transform that raw ingredient into its safest and most nourishing form possible? And you know that that is the difference between what we're doing and, and, and most of the other diets, uh, at all of them where, yeah, what source of highest quality food is possible. Um, there's a great, amazing conversations to be had about low carb and all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, not, but, and <laughs> no matter, no matter, no matter where you land on that, you know, dietary, uh, what answer, right. What, what, what you actually are putting into your body, there is something you can be doing to literally every one of those foods to then improve that dietary choice. I love that. I absolutely love that. So that goes back to my the three tenets that I use for nutrition are, are nutrient density, bioavailability, and satiety. And what you're saying is no matter what we're eating, there are things that we can do to prepare that food so that it is the most nutrient dense, the most bioavailable, and the most satiating. Right. So that uh, however we get it, wherever it's coming from, if you want to be paleo, if you want to be low carb, if you want to be keto, if you want to be carnivore, we can process our food and prepare it so that we get the most out of it every single time. Every single time. The only other fourth thing I would add to that, and those are um, so the the satiation piece is incredibly important. It's not one that I usually bring up, but it is a very important one. Um, The other one that I do, you know, for my three, it's safety, nutrient density and bioavailability. And the safety is really important here. Um, and give me, give me two seconds because this this I think can re- can really help lay the groundwork. Yeah. Um, for some of it, if you look at our so three and a half million years of technological innovation with food, and if you look at the technologies our ancestors developed throughout that, let's forget the agricultural revolution for a minute up until that moment because mm-hmm. when the agricultural revolution hits, most of our technological innovation just goes into how to farm, right, right. and how to plant crops. But let let's let's up until that point. We can really divide plants, you know, technologies related to animals in our diets and technologies related to plants in our diets. And if you, and this really says a lot about the safety piece as well as the bioavailability piece. Almost all the technologies developed over millions of years when it comes to including animals in our diet are focused on how to get that animal how to overcome our physical limitations and actually get the animal itself. And it's okay. at ladles and spears and bows and arrows and throwing sticks and boomerangs and nets and fishing hooks and all traps, all those things, you know, to allow us to actually get the animal. Once you have that animal, like you don't need anything else except for a sharp edge tool. Like, you know, you're, you're looking at however big that animal is a pile of the most nutrient dense bioavailable food humans have ever known. And all you got to do is get into it. Right. There's a little bit, you can improve the, uh, bioavailability of red meat slightly by physically breaking it down and and and, and cooking it slightly, but not anything huge. Yeah. The, the organs, the blood, all of that is you know in a raw state is as bioavailable as it can come. So all you need to do is get the animal and cut it open and you're good to go. Plants are the exact opposite. You know, if we look at all the technology developed around including plants in our diets for the past several million years, very little effort has gone into how to actually get it. You know, a digging stick, sure banging two rocks together to crack open the nuts, sure. But almost all of our mental energy focused, you know, focused on how to actually do, you know, include that food in our diet has to do with detoxifying the plants because every plant on the planet has some level of toxin in it. Mm -hmm. So getting, making those plants safe. And then just as importantly, even though if a plant has nutrition and they do, most of it's not readily available to our bodies. It's either not available at all to our bodies or our bodies have to work really, really hard really to get that hard. nutrition. So the technology would be, the other technology is, you know, what do we do to the, those foods to uh, make those nutrients accessible to our bodies? Okay. And that's really, really telling. If our focus is on safety, nutrient density, bioavailability, you cannot do better than animals. And we've never been able to do better than animals. Yeah. That doesn't mean our ancestors weren't eating plants. They were eating plants. But when they included plants, you got to believe they spent a lot, a lot of time doing something to it to get it ready for our bodies. Gotcha. And that's where fermentation comes from, right? I mean, that's one of the yeah. main the main things for that, right? Yeah. Fermentation is one of many things, but it's the most powerful one. And I've never, I have never read about, heard about, um, witnessed a traditional or indigenous diet around the world that doesn't have fermentation at its core. When it comes to things like vegetables, dairy, all of it. So here's, a, I'm going to use a big word. Here's a dichotomy of information that I'd like you to talk about when we talk about fermentation. Okay. Yeah. We talk about now how alcohol is a poison. Alcohol is toxic. 
Okay. But if you go back to the dark ages, beer is what got humans through, right? <laughs> yeah. So how does yeah. that work? <laughs> Well, there's, well, see, and this is, this is why I love conversations like this. And when, yeah. and when we're starting to answer that, when we, when we bring into the conversation that how we can start having real conversations, like, you know, for example, if you want to talk about bread, if it was just like, is, should, should humans be eating bread or not? It's a silly, never, no, don't ever engage in that conversation. If you want to have a conversation, you know, about can something like a sourdough bread be a part of a healthy human diet? Well, we can at least have a conversation, but when you're talking about bread and you're lumping it all together, we're talking about many, many completely different foods. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with alcohol. If you're talking about Everclear or a, a wild <laughs> fermented beer, that's a completely different thing or me, right. they're, different, they're different foods. Yeah. So let's start off. So I, when I try to answer any of these questions or at least get some insight into them, the first thing that I do is look to the past to see you know, what's been a part of our diet for a very long time. Sure. The second thing I do is look at animals or moments in our life as humans, uh, when we may or may not be adapted to certain foods, right? And then, or, or other animals are, and then try to replicate that process through technology. So yep. number one, is alcohol a, a relatively new thing in the human diet? No, it's not, no. right? If you, if, you want, if you want to spend a fun Saturday, after, if, you, if you have some downtime, it sounds like you and I don't have much of, but if you do, <laughs> Google drunken monkey hypothesis. And this okay. hypothesis states that he, mammals, will seek out alcohol whenever possible. Interesting. And yeah, and then what you'll see is a whole bunch of videos of wild animals that are consuming massive quantities of naturally fermenting fruit that have kind of landed in the ground and the you know it's it's spontaneous fermentation and they're full of alcohol. And I mean funny things like giraffes. I mean imagine a completely drunk giraffe. <laughs> We're already goofy awesome. looking anyhow, right? So <laughs> Has alcohol been in our diets? Yes. I mean, yeah. not in the quantity we have access to it today. Right. But yeah, and, and there's a difference between alcohol like mead or beer or wine that is a result of the same sort of fermentation process that produce yogurt and sourdough bread and salami and all that or sauerkraut or taking that to the next level and distilling it and concentrating it and, you know, turning it into sort of a, you know, there's a difference between honey, right, or 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 dehydrated, you know, or munching on a piece of sugar cane and then creating refined sugar. It's it's sort right. of that sort of step, right? So has distilled alcohol at those concentrations been under the eye for a very long time? No, absolutely not. Um, so let's make that um, you know, difference. And then if we look at things like alcohol, you know, how is alcohol really made, and and where can we start to, you know, if you're going to choose to consume alcohol, how how do you start to you know, break it down in your head to say, okay, this might be something I can include in, in moderation or whatever. And this is something I would never want to touch. And this is where I love when, when people can learn how food is made, I think they can, they can empower themselves to make these kind of decisions or go through this thought process. But if you know, Mandy, how some of the stuff is made, you know, it's, you're relying on somebody else to tell you. So here, here's a very quick, a quick example. I discussed some of this in the book, alcohol, like, fruit if you expose it to the natural bacteria and yeast that are in the air it will spontaneously ferment so if you take a grape and crush it right it will the wild yeast if you think if you look at a red grape and see that sort of uh, powdery stuff on the outside that's wild yeast that have already been attracted to the grape and they're sitting out there so if you mm -hmm. crush that grape expose those juices the sugars to create alcohol yeasts eat sugars and create carbon dioxide and and alcohol that, that's how it's made um, mead is made is honey wine made from honey and honey, the con the sugar concentrations are actually too high. So you have to dilute it. If you dilute honey, it will spontaneously ferment and make, and make uh, honey wine or, or mead. Mm. Um, other grains, um, yeast will not work on complex carbohydrates. They'll only work on, on sugars, right? So if you have something like barley to make beer or maize to make an alcohol drink or rice to make, you know, a rice wine like sake, they, it won't it won't do anything until you turn them into simple sugars. Now, there's several ways to do it. Today, in the beer making world, they take the barley and malt it, so they allow it to sprout, and it releases an enzyme, an amylase enzyme, that begins to break down the com complex carbohydrates into sugars, and that's how you make the beer. But in the past, <laughs> the funny thing is, and this is part of our own digestive process, we produce amylase, the enzyme amylase in our saliva. Yep. And if you look at 
the early examples of sake in um, in Japan, or you look at early maize beer in um, Mesoamerica, Mexico. Um, what you what they have people doing is chewing on the grains, you know, inoculating it with that enzyme. The enzyme starts working, and they're spitting it back out into a big vat. The amylase enzyme is breaking oh, down into simple sugars. I had no and then, idea what. Absolutely. So chicha, which is a traditional um, uh, maize uh, or, or, or maize beer, is done that way. And I'll tell you what, I've done it with students. It's great. Actually, I did it with students and served the beer to our, the board of the college. <laughs> board of business and governor. I told them what it was. Yeah, the yeah. first class we had, we sat around a table and just chewed on maize and spit it out. It was a great class. That's um, crazy. Okay. So, so when I'm talking about beer from the dark ages, that's is that oh well, they're they, malting at the, that malting. time they're so even malting. back then it was malting. okay so this is right. like but, regional but here's what's cool about it. so the two things uh one is that the beer you're talking about is called small beer and they call it small beer because it has a low alcohol percentage so that process of creating the beer and that fermentation um it, it, you know doesn't purify the water but gets rid of a lot of nasty pathogens fermentation right. in general will, will do that and I had a student, and this is about six years ago. One, uh, he was a he was a double major history anthropology um, major focus, and in history classes, he's always heard these stories about the small beer, and and it, this is how people got through the dark ages. And he says, "But I never has anybody ever done it." I said, "I don't know. I've never heard of them, but they talk about it all the time." I said, "Do it." Yeah. So we did it for a class project. So what he did was he took um, he took beer. Or he took he 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 knew how to make the beer, so he actually inoculated it before the fermentation with E. coli. Just as an example of, of a pathogen you can get right. in there, right? And we did this through the um uh through the science department at the college too. So he had a measured amount of E. coli he inoculated it with, and he did it in in a lot of beer making. There's a boil process, um. So we did it after that to make sure that it wasn't the it boiling. wasn't yeah, the yeah. boiling. Yeah, and he put E. coli in there and just let it ferment. So the results would only be there, you know, any, any more or less of the E. coli would only be impacted through the fermentation process, did it. And then at the end of the fermentation process, there was zero E. coli detected in there at all. And it was, hold on, I got a street sweeper going by. <laughs> it was, it was my, so the, the scientist that was helping us with it, um, couldn't believe it so made us replicate it again and sent it yeah. out to to a different machine that had a you know a, a better way to measure it and and it did and it's fan and it was amazing so wow it, it's true that's from the fermentation and we see it all the time you know we downstairs in the modern science kitchen we make all of our cheese you make sauerkraut we, we we use fermentation on a daily basis and one of the things that it does is um it creates an acidic environment uh Kind of like when you're making pickles, you know, fast pickles at home mm -hmm. and you're adding vinegar. When you drop that pH by creating that acidic environment, it is very inhospitable to nasty pathogens. And even here, it, you know, all the different states, if you get that seven is neutral, if you get down to below 4.6, you're in a, a very safe zone, which is, you, you can reach in, in a matter of days or, or, or a week or so. And you know, incredibly safe environment without any refrigeration whatsoever. And we, we all know the ben the other benefits of fermentation as well. Right. So as far as alcohol is concerned, um, you know, distilling is a much more recent thing. So we're talking about whiskey and vodka and gin. That's much, much, much more recent. It's a whole deal. But okay. the process of doing these ferments to create wine and honey wine or mead and beer uh, have been at some level for forever, right? Yeah. And yeah. have been in our diets at some level. Again, nowhere near what we have in our diets today. But the final thing I would like to say very quickly about the beer, and this hasn't been tested yet. I want to do a bunch of work on it, but we do do a lot of work with sourdough bread. Yeah. And the, the cool thing about sourdough bread is we use wild yeast to make the bread rise. Mm -hmm. But we also, the other fermentation that takes place at the same time is the bacterial fermentation, which does a lot of stuff. It, it improves the flavor, but it also helps make um, the grains uh, turns them into a, a safer and more more uh, bioavailable state for our bodies. Okay. And with beer used to be made the same way. Like all beers used to be sour beers because you get to the you get to the point where you've you know you've kind of converted the complex carbohydrates into simple sugars, and now all of a sudden it was a spontaneous fermentation, just like with sourdough bread, where you have wild yeast and wild bacteria working at the same time. 
and it created sour beers. And sour beers are now a, a new thing in the you know the beer market. Right. But it wasn't until the 1800s when we isolated just bacteria and just started making beer in these really sterile environments and inoculating it with this bacteria that we created the beers that most of us grew up with, right? Mm-hmm. Budweiser and those sorts of things. Sour beers, even though they're done now for flavor purposes, I do believe are a healthier beer. If you're going to drink beer, a mm-hmm. real sour beer in my mind is probably a healthier option hmm. than, okay. than, than just a yeasted one for the same reason sour right. bread is. Right. Cool. All right. And just so anybody listening, uh, we want to clarify, we're not, pro- we're not, promoting that you should be drinking beer i think what we're talking talking about you know (laughs) all of this stuff and and this is one of the challenges that i think that i know i have as an influencer i see other influencers i see you put information out and stuff is is people need to listen to this stuff everyone listening please put your context to all the information that we're talking about if you are an alcoholic and we're talking about you know this beer is healthier than that beer that doesn't mean you should go drink beer if you have a bad relationship with the food and you're trying to avoid carbs because you know if you go down that road, it's going to set you off in a direction you don't want to go, then don't listen to sourdough bread is healthier so you can eat it and go eat a bunch of sourdough bread. This is information that is applicable based on an individual experience, individual goals, um, but an understanding that nothing is necessarily bad and there are ways to make things better from a bioavailability's perspective. And that's kind of really what we're talking about. You know, th- thank you for clarifying that. Let me just say this off the get go, and I should have started this way. I fully believe that an animal-based diet is the safest, most nutrient dense and bioavailable diet that we can, we, humans can have, period. Yeah. And I also believe it's when we introduce the animal, and, and I'd love to have some time to talk about the entire animal piece, but when we introduce animals into our diets, the entire animal is when we, for the first time ever, experience as a species, massive body and brain growth, population size, all of that. So that's number one. Number two, I believe there are reasons to eat certain vegetables, and there are some we can include in our diet that are safer and require less work to get nourishment from them than others. So those are in our diets at some level in, in my family. And the other ones we need to pay a lot of attention to. Either there's a whole bunch of the plants I would never eat. There's other plants that I would never eat without processing them properly. Mm-hmm. I also fully believe that dairy, fermented fermented high quality dairy um, can be a healthy part of a, of a human diet. Beyond that, the reason, and I know it's hard and we get in some gray areas because you're absolutely right when, 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 you know, we have a platform to say some of this, um, people cherry pick it. And and sometimes, and and, and then, Oh, you know what? I I, I was trying to not have beer for nine months. And now all of a sudden they say beer is good. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. We, what, what the population, the audience that I, my wife and I and our family are typically dealing with are people and this, and I think this is quite often across the board. There's somebody in the family who is, you know, Nose to the grindstone. I'm going to improve my health and do anything it takes. You know, I'm going to go full bore keto, full bore carnivore, full bore whatever. Yeah. But you still have a wife or a husband or a partner and four kids. And, you know, one person is off chasing their dream version of health and everybody else is eating mac and cheese. And what, <laughs> yeah. what we're trying to do is make sure that 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 person who's off and running is, is fine getting what they can to, to be nourished. But at the same time, they're taking incremental steps for their family who might not be on the same, you know, path at that level, but you still want to make sure everybody, everybody's nervous. Bring everybody closer to, to closer to that, that goal. Yeah. I get yeah. It. That's awesome. All right. I got a couple other questions. So um, one of the, the interesting things that gets into the discussion of what we used to eat and what's proper is people. And I think cherry picking is a good word to use examples from different parts of the world Mm. right what is some of the differences or some of the the consistencies that you find going back thousands millions of years that regardless of where you are in the world we're still humans and we're still basically eating similar things is that is that the case or is it really is it really that much disparity between regions of the world and what people ate there's this and i'd like to kind of default here a little bit to weston price um if anybody doesn't know Dr. Weston Price has worked in the 1930s, he traveled the world and documented a lot of information about what people are eating, but also their 
their dent, he was a dentist, their dental health, but also their overall right. health. And, and one of the things that he found, which is the same thing that, that we've been finding both through the archaeological record, but also through our ethnographic work, is that even, you know, in different parts of the world, there are no doubt different resources, right? At, but the same kind of types of uh, uh, categories of food or categories of nutrients that people need, they're fulfilling in, in, in different, you know, in a fine resolution way, in a different way. But mm -hmm. when you look at it from a larger context, it's like, oh, well, they're doing the same sort. So he, here's the kind of thing that, that Weston Price noticed. Again, we do too. You know, high quality animal foods are, you know, a, a centerpiece of, of, of diets and the entire animal. You know, this idea right. that, you know, we're just eating, you know, we're, we're trying to eat a carnivore diet and we're eating, you know, T-bone steak every night is sort of absurd. That, that's, that's no, Nobody did that in the past. People, you know, they would take that. And this is, again, one other quick caveat or sort of it. The kind of conversation we're having has to be at a, you know, 20,000 foot view because we can't sit here and have a conversation about three and a half million years of, of dietary change in an hour in, right, right, we, we take right, months right, and right, weeks. Sure. But, yeah. so we have to make generalizations but with, with, with that said in general people took down an animal they ate that animal start to finish and then took down another animal another, now right. there's certainly examples of buffalo jumps and these sorts of things but in general that that's how it worked so they're eating the entire animal the most nutrient dense bioavailable part of an animal is the blood the fat and the organs the meat is more nutrient dense than anything else in, in their diets outside of an animal but is it is the least nutrient dense part of an animal if mm -hmm. it's fully about nutrient density and bioavailability meat is great blood fat and organs are better okay. so when you get all of that in the same picture and then one other quick aside and i know this is a little bit off topic but i, I feel the need to to bring this up I am get. I am a huge proponent of of nose to tail butchering, cooking, and eating. I think it's not only the most nourishing way to do it, but also the most ethical and sustainable. But and there's been luckily a lot of publicity, or at least social media, around eating organ meats now. Right. But it's <laughs> it's it's gotten a little bit to the to to the extreme and the absurd. And so now we're asking people are asking me, well, how much liver should I actually be eating? Like, should I be how much liver should I be eating? And it's an absurd question if you really think about it, because it's a question we never had to ask before. And the answer is, you know, if I ask any indigenous or traditional group right now that had just taken down whatever, and I, and I, you know, a gazelle, and I said, how much liver should you be eating? And they're like, whatever that animal has. And I'm going to eat its heart and its spleen and its kidneys and its meat and its fat. And then I'm going to go kill another gazelle. Right. You know, here we have the opportunity because most of us aren't raising our own animals or butchering our own animals or we, we everything's getting done and packaged. We can, for the first time ever in the history of our species, go and buy pieces in bulk and we can go into Whole Foods and buy 20 pounds of chicken liver and right. not have a bone or a, a piece of fat or meat or anything. It's just the livers. And then so we've created this weird situation where we have to ask how much liver should we be eating? Right. The answer. So anyhow, nose to tail approach animals. We see this across the board. Fat is an incredibly um, important component of diets everywhere, everywhere. Now, if you, now some people would say, um, you know, people who are trying to suggest a low fat diet or, or a plant based diet would say, hey, wait, that, that doesn't make sense because, you know, you get towards the poles and, and it's colder and animals have more fat higher time, you know, throughout most of the year and you get more closer to the equator. And the animals are leaner and, you know, well, that's true. But the reality is that's, again, from a very superficial um, way of looking at animals um, when you're not dealing with animals yourself or a complete note. The, the first fat our ancestors ever had in the, you know, the, the, from an animal is marrow. We have we have examples where bones are busted open intentionally for bone marrow at 3.4 million years ago. Um, we, we actually have that that evidence before we even found the tools that did them. So it predates right. by wow. 100,000 years. Wow. So marrow, the animals will starve themselves to death before they deplete their marrow stores. They always have marrow. And the other part that we don't necessarily think about, so there's three, there's three ways to get fat from animals. One is this, you know, the fat that you just see if you cut an Scared. animal open it, right? It, 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 and the stuff that's just under the skin, it, it's surrounding the muscles, surrounding the organs. So you have that fat. Mm -hmm. You have the marrow, which is inside of the bones. And you also have something called bone grease. 
which is actually in the matrix of the bone walls themselves. Huh. And all you need to do, if anybody's making bone broth or Italian gravy or any of those sorts of things, you take, and you don't have to sit there and pick them out. Um, we did a study several years ago. We took 13 deer and extracted all the marrow from 13 deer from every little bone in the body. I mean, it took days. And I mean, we had yeah. graduate student help. I mean, it took days, <laughs> but that's silly because you just take those bones, you throw them in a pot of water and, you know, heat it up. The marrow melts out, the bone grease melts out. You have you know, access to all that fat with, with very, very little work. Hmm. So okay. fat is incredibly important across the board. The other thing you get when you get closer to the equator and you have less so that visceral fat from these animals is you do, you do see in certain locations supplementing that with um, high quality plant fat, like coconut fat, you know, co yes. coconut oil. Okay. So fats are important. Um, also dairy fats are inc incredibly important as well. Uh, there was a new study that came out recently that showed when uh, we started uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, dairying animals, um, meat consumption starts to go down. Uh, animal, they were killing less animals in this particular site uh, for their meat because they were able to get the fat they needed okay. from the dairy on a regular basis. Interesting. So okay. you see that. Uh, if they're eating grains, the grains are always either fermented or spreaded or a combination of both. Um, vegetables are almost always fermented. We see this uh, across the board as well. Um, again, fat, fat is is one of the main things. Yeah. Okay. So fat. there definitely are differences regionally going back in time, but the 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 main components are all still the same. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question, I think, before we go, we've been on for about an hour, and that is, uh, I often hear because I'm a proponent of particularly for people that are low carb, carnivore, keto, whatever that we increase our electrolyte intake. And one of the questions I get all the time is, well, if I'm eating everything that I need to eat and I'm getting nutrient dense food, I'm being getting bio bioavailable, satiating food. And in my meat, if meat has everything I need, why do I need to supplement with electrolytes? And one of the, the and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong here, the, the two main reasons that I, that I talk about and tell people, I said, one, um, we don't, the, the, the our soil, our water, all of the things that we have now are processed. Everything's taken out. We don't have mineral water anymore. We don't have electrolytes in our water anymore. It's not in our soils anymore. All this stuff is gone. So anything that we're getting from that is basically useless, number one. And number two, we're not eating the full animal. We're not eating blood. We're not drinking blood. We're not getting and the amount of sodium in animal blood, right, is is crazy. So just in general, because because I love this, how we get our food now is different. We have to supplement with additional electrolytes because it's not there anymore. Does that kind of sum it up? Okay. Yes. So a couple of just quick numbers that are really important here, I think. Number one, even with just the what, the how is incredibly important in this conversation, but even the what, the food that we're eating, like you mentioned, is different food. Like don't go into the grocery store and, you know, go through the produce section and get whatever and think you're acting like a, a, a you know, a forager gatherer ancestor because <laughs> the raw materials that are sitting in front of you are different. The fruit, the fruit that you see in the grocery store is nothing like what wild fruits look like. They're bigger. They're full. They're full of water. They're full of sugar. They're they require less work to get it there. So there's a lot of things different about them. Um, the plants themselves, even those that have nutrition are less nutrient dense than they were. An apple today has uh, 19, an, a, a normal apple in 1950 had three times more nutrients in it than an average apple today, which wow. means you have to eat just, just the nutrient wise, you have to eat three apples today to get the same nutrition that your grandfather got by eating one apple then. But plus you get all the extra sugar and all the extra yeah. nonsense with it as well. That's so this, crazy. But like you said, with the animals, it's a complete same thing. Not only are we not eating the entire animal, but the animals that we're eating, most of them are not eating the diets they're supposed to be eating. So that right. you don't have those nutrients in there as well. Huge across the board. I just one more number I want to throw out or set of numbers. I mentioned that deer study we did. We um, This was a study to try to answer a lot of different questions. But the a big takeaway for this conversation is we took 13 deer and we butchered them in the same way that most hunters today would butcher them, but it, it replicates the same way that we butcher animals today, you know, butcher pigs and cows today. And, uh, and we took the meat and set it aside. We used it, but for the calculations, we just set it aside. So all the stuff that an average hunter would keep, which is the same proportion of that animal that an average amount of pork or beef, you know, would, would stay in, in, in the grocery store system. And we looked at everything else. 
So an average size white-tailed deer um, here in Eastern North America, we looked at 13 of them and look at the caloric, just because it was easy, the caloric and what was left calorie wise that is usually left in the woods or whatever. So we took all the organs, the blood, the fat, including the bone grease and the marrow. And we looked at all the, the calories that are left behind. What is left behind for an average size white tailed deer, depending on your caloric intake from a couch potato to an Olympic athlete would provide you with enough calories for 13 to 31 days worth of nutrition. And, and that's again, what people leave behind. That's what's left behind. And that's for a, a deer. The average size pig is bigger than that. And the average size cow is bigger than that. But we also found that the nutrition, and we, this is not new, but the nutritional, so we eat, we keep about half of the animal by weight in meat. That's what makes it to the grocery store shelves. That's what most of us have right. access to if we're buying our meat. By weight, the other half of the animal is either wasted or used for other purposes, but not for, for human food. So half the, by weight, half the nutrition is gone. But the reality is we're talking about the more nutrient dense bioavailable parts of that animal is the part that's right. getting wasted. So the nutrition that you don't have access to when you're not eating that way, you you don't have access to more than half of the nutrition that that animal right. can provide, which is the kind of same kind of thing you were just saying. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. That's fantastic. This has been really good information. Um, I know that when we first got on, you had asked something about your son. He's trying to put on some muscle. So let's flip it and see if I can help answer Please some do. of this question yeah so what's the, so what's I, the story? I don't know these things i i grew up reading muscle and fitness magazine in the 1980s so I think <laughs> my information is, is certainly quite old um I, so he's 16 years old okay. he's an incredible athlete he has a very low body fat percentage he works out really really hard he's in the gym all the time um and the question he asked me was um and i don't have the answer and i said i would ask you uh, here we are. What is it? It's early September now. Yep. He um, thought that it would be a good idea to bulk and eat massive quantities of food and, and bulk to sure. um, until you know later into the winter and then start cutting for the beef. Now, remember, he's 16 years old, so part of his mindset is about athletic performance. A part of it is looking Just good looking in good. the beach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, all right. So. The first thing, the traditional, and this is this exact thing is one of the reasons I started doing carnivore because I got tired of the cycle. Okay. I got tired of, I have to get fat to get strong and I have to get lean, weak to get lean. So I would get strong, I'd get big, I'd get, you know, put on 10, 15 pounds. Most of it was fat, but weight moves weight and all my stuff would go up. And then, okay, now I want to get back down to, 10% or some kind of good, good body fat percentage. And now all of a sudden everything's going down. I can't lift as much. I can't perform as well. And it was just really annoying. Um, I get all these PRs and then six months later, I'm back down to not being able to do that. So with carnivore and with the focus on protein, so really just let him know all he needs to do is increase his protein. That's the only thing he needs to do. And if he's working out five, more than five days a week, he's probably working out too much. Okay. Right. So the three things that you need to build muscle are adequate protein, adequate resistance training and adequate rest. So if he's, if he's working out six days a week, seven days a week, he needs to chill out, go to five days a week, lift heavy, and then take two days off or get two what days about, a week off in there. What about a 16 year old and the role of carbohydrates in a 16 year old versus a 40? Is there a difference? Oh, it's fuel. So the issue is for him, he is going to be overall less affected by the negative effects of carbs because he's younger. So any additional oxidative stress, his body doesn't have years of having to worry about dealing with that. So he can use carbs for fuel. He doesn't need to. I would highly recommend because I think he'll actually be able to get more volume in and do more work in general. Um, if he does go lower carb and does become ketogenic in his, in his workouts, which I have some videos on my YouTube, if you want to point them to my YouTube channel I will, absolutely. on that. Um, but the, the idea, his body is going to make whatever he needs. And unless he's doing two and a half hour carb depletion workouts every day, then he's going to replenish his carbs by the time he get, does another workout. So okay. he doesn't need to ingest carbs. So sure. the 
the cutting thing is a 1980s thing. It is. Well, it, it, it's people still do it now. But if you look at me, like right now, I'm doing it in lean bulk. So lean bulk has become more of the, the phrase that people are trying to starting to realize is possible. So I've been maintaining, um, I'm five months in now. Um, I maintained it less 10% or less body fat percentage. I put on five pounds of muscle. Hmm. So my body fat mass has not changed. I've got 19 to 20 pounds of body fat on my body, but I've put on five extra pounds of nothing but muscle. Wow. So that's how you want to do it. How do you, sorry, I get to ask you all these questions. Yeah, yeah. So this is great. <laughs> how do you determine what kind of meat you're going to eat? Do you cycle through anything? Is it just what's in front of you? Do you make whatever, a conscious decision? Whatever I feel like, yeah. It's more about my macros. So I, you know, cause I don't eat anything else other than meat and eggs. So it's not like I have to worry about, do I have to fit this or fit that or whatever else, or is this healthy or not? So for me, it's just, I have a, a fat goal and I have a, a, a protein minimum, right? So right now I'm, I'm 185 pounds. I'm six feet tall, 50 years old. I eat 200 grams of protein minimum every day. And I keep my fat at about 135, 140 every day. And so you do keep an eye on your fat. I keep an eye because I don't want to go over. So there's this, this concept that I call maximum energy threshold which is the maximum amount of energy you can take in a day before your body stores it. Mm. Okay. So a lot of people look at what they call their TDEE, total, dinner, total, total daily energy expenditure, and they try to match their all their calories. And, screw that. I don't care because I don't count protein as a calorie. I just count my fuel intake. So I know if I, because I've tested it, and this is what a lot of people need to do because it's not about percentages. It's not about a random number. It's about what actually happens in your body. So test, I'm going to take 175 grams of fat, of, of fuel in every day and see what happens for two weeks. Did I gain weight? Did I lose weight? Did I gain fat? Did I lose fat? If I lost fat, then I know 175 is not my max. Mm -hmm. So I go to 185. Okay, at 185 over two weeks, I gained two pounds of fat. That's too much for me. So I know if I want to maintain, I should probably be around 170, 175. If I want to lose, I can be at 165 or anything below that and I'll lose body fat. It's hmm. it, and that's kind of how I work it. All right, two final questions. For yeah, you. yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Sure, by the way, sure. Um, herbs and spices. Do you include them at all? Oh, I do for sure, absolutely. I mean, yeah, besides it, salt, it gets so boring, man. Yeah, no. So, okay. um, and 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 if you're some people are sensitive to nightshades, so they can't do peppers and things like that, like whatever right. else. But for the most part, it's salt. Um, I, I do Redmond's lemon pepper. Mm -hmm. and then Redmond's garlic pepper. So those are the two probably biggest ones. And then I don't know if you've heard of pork and good. They have some seasonings as well. They've got a really good all season. They've got a taco seasoning. They got a, they got a bacon seasoning, which is crazy. Um, hmm. So I do, I do some of those as well. All right. Final question. What do you track regularly? Like, do you have a CGM at all? Do you care about any of that kind of things? No. Do, you, do you have a, 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 a an aura ring, anything like that? No. So I, well, I track my sleep because I'm trying to, that's one of the things I'm trying to do is get better sleep lengthwise and quality wise, because that's the most anabolic time of day. So the more sleep you can get, and he's 16, he probably gets plenty of sleep. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. Not worried about his sleep. So, um, the that's I track my sleep um, from a regular basis. Every week I have an in-body body composition scale. So I track my body fat, my lean mass, my skeletal muscle mass, all those percentages body composition wise. And then just what I eat daily to make sure I'm meeting my protein and not going over my fat. Nice. But I don't do ketones. I don't do blood sugar and that kind of stuff because ketones don't matter. And I'm not worried about the sugar I'm taking because I'm not eating any. So this has been awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't, I, I didn't know I was going to get some extra information. Yeah, really absolutely. And, and tell him to check out my YouTube because I do have a bunch of stuff on more specifics about how to gain lean mass, how to exercise okay. while being ketogenic, what that process looks like and how it works and all that stuff too. Awesome. Thank you. You bet, man. Take these. And let's tell everybody real quick where they can find you, any events you have happening we, that we got going on in the near future, things like that. Awesome. So we have, a, we have a couple of things. One is the book you mentioned earlier, Eat Like a Human, uh, which you can get on uh, in hard copy or also on Audible or digital as well. We have, my family has two entities. We have the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, which is a, we call it a foodery, but all of the things that uh, I write about in the book, the results of all the research we've done, we actually uh, 
create and put out in, in real food to help nourish the community. Mm -hmm. So you can check that out at, at modernstonehkitchen.com um, on social media or uh, obviously online as well. It's our website. And then uh, we also have a nonprofit called the Eastern Shore Food Lab. Uh, we created this entity about six years ago through Washington College, but um, we went off on our own. We still have it. And it's, it's our it's our education, research and outreach arm. So we do a lot of classes um, both in person and also virtually. And our goal, our mission is to empower people to nourish themselves and their families uh, in, in the best possible way. And I awesome. truly believe that comes through really understanding their food. So you can check that out at eatlikeahuman.com or follow me on at Dr. Bill Schindler. As okay. far as events are concerned, um, <laughs> the one I'm super excited about is on November 5th. Um, we're teaming up together yeah. and we're, uh, we're creating a meetup and I'm super excited about it because we're not only going to have incredible food and an opportunity to gather and just inspire and learn from one another, but, um, you know, Bronson and Natalie and me and Dr. Gary Schliffer and Dr. Sally Norton and Dr. Stephen Hussey. Am I leaving anybody out? I think I got everybody. I think that's it. There might be some other people showing up, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're going to do a, a big Q and a panel. I'm going to butcher a pig and just go through the basics of it, you know, for the purpose. And I, it's really important for me to people for people to understand where their food comes from and understand how they can connect with it as much as possible. Yeah. And just to show you how easy it is to do that, even in your own kitchen. Sally Norton's given a presentation and again, just great food, great community, great, inspiring people. Um, super excited. Cool. And can you, we put in the show notes, maybe a link. To yeah. The, I'll put the link for the event in there. I think we still have, we still got like 25. We had 50 total slots. I think we've sold like almost 20. So we got like, like 30 left, I think 30, 30 spots open. So. Awesome. We got time. We got some time. Get in there and get it. Um, you're you're going to be doing a pig butchering workshop. Yep. And pig then are we now, are we eating? Are we cooking that pig that you're going to butcher for the tacos later? No, uh, we're no because it, I won't be able to get it, that part done. Time, but, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but we are going to we're going to use um, uh, uh, wild pastures meat to uh, for all okay. the meats that we're going to be eating. And then um, I, I'm I'm super excited. It's going to be great food, great people. And, awesome, and like, awesome. Just like that in, little informational session at the end there, where you know I was asking all those questions from you. We're going to have so many great people to just ask questions and learn from. Right. Cool. All right. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for being on. Hey, my pleasure. Good to see you.